Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Maria, and I'm uh, pleased to present our today's uh, panelists, Virinder Sharma and Marji Van der Uh Virinder has uh, uh, about 15 years of experience, and he has significant exposure to dispute resolution uh, and assistant clients in uh, concluding APA and mutual agreements. Uh, agreements. Uh, he has worked in with the modern 30 uh, with more than 300 slides in India and overseas, uh, and now he's working from our office in CPA Amsterdam. Maji Van den Walk has more than 14 years of experience, and which also includes in-house tax counseling with a focus on international tax planning. Uh, she was exposed to diverse methods such as global uh, and complex transaction tax plans, local and uh, tax and transfer pricing audit, design and implementation of tax control framework. Uh, dear panelists, please start the webinar. Thanks, Maria. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Virinda Sharma. Uh, as you know that the topic for today's discussion uh, is the, the value chain uh, analysis and how to take in control of the new generation of TP documentation. Uh, how we have structured this webinar today is that we would like to first introduce to, to the concept of uh, value chain analysis. What is value chain analysis? And then we would like to sh share with you why value chain analysis is required now. And then we want to see in the context of the OECD and other references from different countries, how they are looking at value chain analysis today. And then we will share with you some tactical situations by, by applying value chain analysis techniques. And then finally, we will share our conclusion and also inform you about the impact of not conducting a value chain analysis. And then at the end of the session, we're going to have a Q&A session where you can ask questions to us and uh, we will re respond to those questions. Next slide. Please, uh, please bear with, with us a few seconds. Yeah. So I'm on, on the slide number three. So first of all, we have to understand why value chain analysis has become so important and what value chain analysis is. As we know that the, the, the first detailed guidance from the OECD we had was in 1995, although we did have a guidance on transcription before, but the detailed guidance, which was quite elaborative, was in 1995. And for the last 20, for the last 20 odd years, the analysis has focused more on function assets and risk understanding of of the of the of the ME so that we can find what's the right arm's length price for the intercompany transaction. And while doing so, the emphasis was mainly on looking at the tested party and few occasions we also looked at the other party to the transactions when when we applied a profit that method. Now, over the years, as we know that the world has become more integrated, the world has more globalized, and there are certain industries where digitization is playing a, a very key role in, in earning profits for the groups. And there have been occasions where certain companies they were parking profits in those jurisdictions where they did not have people function. It's merely on the basis of legal contracts. So to to control that, we 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 the OCD came out with the the concept of value chain analysis in in its guidance through best action eight, ten, and also action in action thirteen, where we have master file in which we need to provide that level of information. So that's the genesis behind why we are discussing value chain analysis today. Now, at the very basic level, 
when we do value chain analysis, what we are looking for? We're looking for the value that an entity creates. The value can also be created by a unit within, within the legal entity. But the value is created by entity, an entity has people, and those people, they create value. And while creating value, there are also certain value drivers which helps in creating that value. If I just want to put that in a simple equation form, and that's what we see uh, when we understand uh, uh, the model for, for businesses, the value is created when we have the value created and captured is more than the cost of creating the value, then we call that as profit and that's what the margin is. And all, most of the companies, they look for that positive value creation. But if I have to define what, what value chain analysis refers to, then it talks about the entire performance process of a company, which begins with, a, with the research and development and ends with the delivery to the end customer. So it covers the whole full chain starting from where raw material is sourced, or talking to the vendor, producing it, processing it, and supplying to the customer, and then also what feedback the customer has, the full value chain we have to look at. So in a nutshell, it, it starts from the conception, and conception can also go back to the, the, the creation of idea that what products we should have, how we should produce it, and then sourcing raw material, producing it, selling to customer, and, and then taking feedback from the customer. So the analysis of this full value chain is what we call value chain analysis, and it has got further components to understand that how, how I am performing in comparison to the competitors, what are the key value drivers in my business, and then we have to link that with transfer pricing, then what functions are performed to create that value, and which people and in which entities those people are creating that value. So that's the whole value chain analysis uh, we have to look at uh, for transfer pricing purpose. Now, if I have to uh, look at some example, how a company can create value. Now, creation of this value is subjective, it's perception, but yes, it has to translate into, into monetary value. So one example could be a manufacturer, if he produces a high quality product, customers will value it because there's a high technology behind. So that's something highly valuable for the company, for the group, and that's how the value is created. If I take the case of a retailer, and that retailer is selling uh, uh, products to customers uh, uh, in, in its uh, premises, then the value which is created is the design of the uh, outlet, the design of the shop, what experience a customer gets, that's the value. Uh, is created by the retailer. So again, this is an example when we, when we say that how the value is created, but when we have to compare that with transfer pricing, we have to understand that the value chain analysis is complete for transfer pricing once we actually look at function analysis, which involves understanding function exception risk. So far, this approach has been one-sided where we just look at a tested party and if that tested part is a cost center, we say that we should give a cost plus and, and we prepare a report. However, there are cases where if the companies keep paying cost plus to a cost center and the principal who is a profit center keeps bleeding with losses continuously, one has to step back and understand how much is the total profit in the value chain? Is that business really viable? Is that pricing model really viable? And when we have to do that, we have to move to a two-sided approach. And when we have to move to a two-sided approach, we not only have to look at two related parties, but we have to go beyond that and do a comparison at, in, at industry-wide level. How other players are earning, why they're earning more than me, why I'm earning less than them. And then we have to look for drivers, we have to look for uh, uh, some, some activities which are creating losses in the value chain. Now, another, another thing we have to keep in mind is that we can say that those activities are creating value only if you are able to separate them. Because if you're not able to identify them, then it's too difficult to say whether they're creating value. And how we can separate those activities? Only if 
they have external market only if the products which are produced through those activities their external market only if those activities have significant if they are significant uh, uh, they comprise a significant portion of the cost of the of the company only if those activities are also performed by other competitors in the market then we can draw some comparison right so all these things are important for us to apply the value chain analysis and and the fact is that the value chain analysis helps in confirming that the outcomes of the transaction policy of a company reflects value creation and that is very important especially when we look at action 13 where we have now three uh, layered documentation approach master file local file and country by country reporting so now the tax authorities they have got they have got they have got opportunity to connect the dots so wherever if there is any mismatch between the information supplied uh, in one documentation to another the officer can challenge it and we'll share some practical examples uh, later in the slides next slide please now the next question we have to address is why is a value chain analysis required now as i already explained that the world has uh, become more and more global we have uh, more companies are falling under digit, digital a uh, digitized economy and uh, and and also that uh, uh, there have been cases of uh, tax avoidance where companies they pocket profits in those countries where they had almost negligible uh, uh, employee strength and because of that value chain analysis has become important so that the companies uh, or the entities who get high profit should also be contributing high in the value chain and when i say they are contributing high in the value chain i'm not looking at only one year analysis now today we are moving towards uh, towards a situation where we have to do a multiple year multiple year analysis so that we know how this value value is being created and how the entity who is creating value whether that entity is being rewarded uh, uh, properly or not so it's more about uh, the holistic view which is important and this holistic view of allocation of margins and profits across the multinational enterprise group was missing before and because of that the allocation of profits was not aligned uh, properly with people function which are responsible for such profit creation so so the action 8 10 and action 13 deliverable last year by the ocd has actually uh, has lifted the analytical focus in transpressing and where we are we are moving from a transactional approach to to the context of commercial and financial relationship relations having said that even before uh, uh, the beps guidance we were still looking at industry analysis we are still looking at industry dynamics in industry analysis we are still looking what companies facts in company analysis we are still discussing about functions assets and risk however we were not actually connecting that with the, the the industry in which the the company was operating we were not comparing how the, the company or the tested party is uh, comparing or, or the whole group is comparing with the competitors in the market and then look for the value drivers that analysis was missing in the past so for example in the past if the company who was owning the intellectual property was funding it as a legal owner that entity was still getting a, a, a good share of profits but after after beps and especially after this value chain analysis it will be important to understand that there should be people function in that ip company who are not only owning the ip legally but also managing the ip developing the ip or controlling the development of ip but at the same time their activity should also be creating value so it's not that i have got eight ten smart people in ip company and they are managing the ip and then i say that ip company should get profits but then i have to check that if i compare with the industry how this entity is faring is those activities contributing value in the value chain if not even if we have people function they will not justify to get profits in today's time so so the key the key message here is that the focus is shifted from testing standalone entities which we call tested tested parties to mapping the relative position of the group entities which are involved in the process of jointly creating value for the group so it's all about analyzing the whole group like 
uh, and then we have to present some information in, in master file. Some part of the information will be reflected in local file and then some quantitative numbers and uh, and also some information whose which function is activities performed by which entity. That level of information would need to be provided uh, in Action 13 documentation. Next slide. So yeah, next slide. So Margie, if you can take the next slide. Thank you. As Virenda already touched upon, the regulatory background associated with value chain analysis is anchored in several OCD references. As a part of its strategy on development, the concept of global value chains was already adopted by the OCD Council in May 2012. Most recently, the OCD has embraced the global value chain concept in the BEPS report on Action A to 10. In the subsequent discussion draft on revised guidance on profit splits of July this year, the OECD has further emphasized on the concept of global value chains for MEs. As part of the BEPS report on Action A to 10, a mandate is included for follow up work to be done on the transactional profit split method, which will be carried out during this year and finalized in the first half of 2017. This work should lead to detailed guidance on the ways in which the method can be applied to align transfer pricing outcomes with value creation, including in the situation of integrated global value chains. The consultation process confirmed that transactional profit splits can offer a useful method, which has the potential, when properly applied, to align profits with value creation for arm's length pricing purposes. In particular, in situations where the features of the transactions make, make the application of other transfer pricing methodologies problematic. And here is the strong connection with value chain analysis. As the purpose of value chain analysis is to identify the features of the commercial and financial relations between the M&A group and entities to determine an appropriate profit splitting factor. A value chain analysis should consider where and how value is created in the business operations of the m and &E group. This includes weighting of the significant functions, assets and risks as well as people functions responsible for such functions, assets and risks, and an impact of the economic circumstances. Economic circumstances may create opportunities to capture profits in excess of what the market would otherwise allow, and whether such value creation is sustainable. For example, whether market advantages are protected due to barriers to entry the market to potential competitors, or the impact of valuable intangibles. This also refers back to the industry analysis, which is part of the value chain analysis. Uh, Madhi, one question I have is that when I look at, uh, especially developing markets, uh, and some of them they're part of the OCD and others they're not, and then I see this value chain analysis concept, we are looking at the group-wide value chain and then we understand it, apply it to to, to the taxpayer situation. How do you see that, uh, how, how much relevant uh, this could be for, uh, for, a, for an entity which is, which is in, in, in developing country? Do you think they will be uh, really interested in uh, taking this value chain analysis, which will be obviously in master file, right. which will be shared uh, in their local jurisdiction? Yeah. The Texas authority. So what's your take on that? Yeah, on the, um, specifically on the developing countries, you mean, yeah, they, they will be, they are very keen to participate in the BEPS guidance and implement it. And uh, they, they would they hope for a more fair uh, profit allocation, of course, to the countries, to the developing countries, especially those countries who have a lot of FTEs of a multinational um, in, in, in this country, then that they would, they could raise their voice uh, based on this uh, BEPS guidance. Uh, my experience has been working. My experience has been uh, working in in, uh, in few uh, emerging markets has been that where the issue of advertising, uh, promotional and marketing expenditure was a burning issue, and where they were saying where the tax authorities are claiming that that's creating a lot of value, and the local entity in that developing country or emerging market should get more share in the profit. But 
when I look at this value chain analysis, one can one can argue that this value chain analysis will actually lead to more profits allocation to uh, to an entity in developing country. But my view is that that value chain analysis that we talk about that has to be seen in light with how other competitors are doing. For example, if the local advertising and marketing expenditure or function is also done by other competitors and it's part of normal business, then then it may not lead to the generation of marketing intangibles locally. So this value chain analysis could also help in justifying the existing policies of yeah, the M&E okay. group yeah. where they have an entity uh, say in, in, in emerging market and although incurring heavy AMP expenditure, but it's still not creating marketing intangibles because one has to still incur that AMP expenditure to survive in the market, but not creating any marketing intangibles. So, but when I look at this, my next my next point question is that this value chain analysis has to be part of uh, part of the master file, and uh, yes. and some concepts needs to be reflected appropriately in in local file maybe function analysis. But when I specifically look at master file, where one has to talk about value chain, how profit is allocated uh, in between different parts of the value chain. Now this is more driven by the by the head office, right? Where you have got central team is sitting there. So, don't you think that this is more like a, a lopsided or you know one-way traffic from where the value chain and analysis is prepared? And you, as you know, that this is not one plus one is equal to two. It also involves a lot of subjectivity. So, right. what do you yeah. think that uh, do you think uh, being this post or post, uh, or coming from the head office? Do you think? That uh, the the subsidy in in say uh, in uh, in in say again I'm taking that example in developing country will be only at the receiving end. It has to accept the value chain which is coming from the from the parent. So what's your view on that? Yeah, right. Well, uh, with the value chain analysis and also connecting all the data points in the different filings that will be due from now on, you know, in the, and in the terms of pricing documentation, the master file, the local file, and all, don't forget the tax returns, the local tax returns and the local uh, uh, transfer pricing forms, as well as the C-by-C report. If those countries will connect all these data points, they can ask questions. And challenge and, 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 and allocation and, and signal and normalities. And so that would give the, it gives them actually extra tools to challenge uh, a situation. Yeah, you're right because if I look at the kind of information which has to be provided in C by C reporting, so one data point is about profits uh, and loss or loss before income tax upon uh, each tax jurisdiction and the revenue also. Right. So and yeah. then number of employees. So if we have an uh, entity in a, in emerging market, there are so many employees and they have less. Uh, yeah, you can profits. do way uh, much further analysis. So apply certain ratios and so on, yeah. and to to uh, to screen the situation. Yeah, and, and then and ask the questions. Yeah, yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can go to the to the next slide then. Yeah, Chinese reference. Um, there are already examples of countries that started to introduce value chain analysis in their local laws. There is the guidance from the Chinese tax authorities, for example, the SAT. Recently, uh, they introduced value chain analysis in June of this year in Notice 42. The requirements for transfer pricing disclosure and documentation include 22 related party transaction forms, including country-by-country -country reporting, and transfer pricing documentation, so a master file, local file, and transaction specific documentation. Notice 42 also includes a lot of requirements for value chain analysis in the local file, namely, as you can see, flows of business goods and materials and capitals within the group, including design, development, manufacturing, marketing, sales, delivery, billing and payment, consumption, after sales service, recycling, other processes related to goods, services, or other relevant underlying targets of the related party transactions and all the parties involved. This should be coupled with annual financial statements of each of these parties for the immediately preceding fiscal year. A measurement and attribution of value creation contributed by location-specific factors should also be included in the local file. 
and allocation um, policies and allocation actual allocation results of the group's profits uh, are in the global value chain. As you can see, very detailed requirements on value chain analysis are included in the law now in China. And from the past, we know that China is very strict in applying it. Um, and another country that is already active on value chain analysis is Germany. The German Ministry of Finance already issued a notification back in April 2005 that the value-added contribution of the taxpayer is often not visible in a function and risk analysis in a transfer pricing documentation. Therefore, the taxpayer must submit a description of the relevant value chain in order to determine the value proportion of the individual group entities in the total value of the group. So it looks like there is a burning requirement for value chain analysis. BEPS means full tax transparency, and BEPS is in fact a merger of location of taxable income with the location of people function, functions responsible for generating it. Also, the wide and or different interpretations of the BEPS and transfer pricing guidance by the different tax authorities of countries can trigger even more double taxation. This means, this means that today, the only way MNEs can defend their current tax and transfer pricing structure is threefold. Full transparency on tax sensitive data, as well as, and here we have it, the complete disclosure of their value chain, and synchronize their corporate governance model, operating model, and tax and transfer pricing model in the same way as synchronizing the economic, legal, and financial realities. This is an important new trend that we see happen in our practice, and we will further talk about this later in this presentation. But the BEPS project is now mandating the use of value chain analysis and its inclusion in transfer pricing documentation to achieve these three points. Yeah. We can go to the next slide. Uh, oh, no. before we go to the next slide, one, one important point is that uh, again, I'm getting back to the emerging markets in developing countries where I've spent many years there. Mm -hmm. Is the issue of location specific advantage or factors? And as you dis discussed, that uh, Chinese authorities are also looking for what value the local location specific factors are adding to the value chain, right? Now, uh, one way to defend this is that there are other players in, this, in the country, you know, they also have same advantages. So when I do benchmarking, it, it, it is resolved. But the challenge is that many times, in, in, in especially in developing countries, it's so difficult to get the right comparables, right? Yeah. So yeah, sure. we yeah. still yeah, have that anom anomaly, anomaly where we don't have comparables. They have same set of locations, specific advantages. So I believe that this value chain analysis, which looks at the industry, overall industry, where the group is operating, and it even it it goes down to the level of the entity. Yeah. So exactly. where yeah. when we are doing industry analysis, we will also compare with other competitors. If there are more players like the group, similar players in China, who also have similar advantages, then then we are not operating in in the environment where there are only selective players and they have local specific advantage. So there are many more players. So that advantage actually, you know, uh, is reduced because there are many, for example, service providers in China who are ready to provide at cost plus or at yeah. routine yeah. return. So this value chain analysis will also go to the extent in addressing these yeah. uh, location specific advantage problem where there can be a huge exposure for a company which has got an entity in, in emerging market and which is operating there for many years and could possibly attract a high value in the value chain analysis. Yeah, absolutely weighted in, yes. So we'll go to the next slide. Now this is my uh, favorite slide, which is value chain by, by Michael Porter. And uh, at, 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 a, at a broad level, this is still valid today, although we have a more globalized world, the business model has changed. We have many uh, M&Es, they are in, uh, some of them, the, some of some of the portions of the business of M&A is, is in digitized world, uh, digitized world. But uh, the business, the way they carry, has changed. 
So at a, at a, at a basic level, when we look at uh, Porter, how Porter defined value chain, and this was defined by him uh, in, in, I think, in 1985, so almost 30 years back, long time back. And there he said that uh, there are primary processes. One has to first look at the primary processes, and which he uh, defined, defined as inbound logistics operations, outbound logistics, marketing, sales, sales and after sales support. And there are support activities which are like firm infrastructure, uh, IT support, technology development, human resource development. So that's kind of a support activities to, to the primary processes. Now the idea uh, here uh, uh, is that uh, Porter wanted to actually define the value chain uh, at, a, at a basic level like this, which means that, and this helps in understanding the further sub activities behind uh, primary activities and also behind support activities to go to that level and understand what interlinkages they have between the activities within primary activities, sub activities within support activities and how the sub activities in support and primary activities they interact with each other. So it's about actually building all those linkages, how those linkages they exist and how those linkages help in creating uh, creating value for the organization. So, so, so if the if there's more value and a comp uh, an organization creates, the more profitable the, the group likely to be. But there are, it depends on various other factors. So, these the, taking primary activities to sub activities and support activities to further sub activities, it's a kind of a building block and to understand how the value is being created. So as I mentioned that identifying the links is very important. So which means finding the connection between all the value activities which we identify in primary and support activities. So and how the interlinkage they helps is one example could be that uh, there can be there can be a link between developing the sales force which is an HR investment and leading to sales volume. Which means that if we have a we have an entity in the group, which is part of the which is performing HR function, leading to the development of those uh, workforce, uh, which becomes smarter and get more business. So one will understand that what value is created by the HR department, and accordingly that entity, which has got HR function as a significant uh, function, should be rewarded accordingly. Right, and 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 when we do these linkages, this is all about we are actually looking at business competency based analysis which actually looks at the broader perspective of a group as a whole rather than only looking at people based function because we are actually linking different sub activities within the overall main main activities i'll go to the next slide now we also have to understand what is the background for carrying out a value chain analysis. Although we 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 did discuss that uh, we 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 have guidance from the OECD in in that action eight to ten and action thirteen plan, but at the same time at a corporate level, why this value chain is so necessary and how that helps the groups. Now uh, this value chain analysis is is important in the sense that. One has to really understand whether the corporate governance policies of the group are they aligned with the operating model and the finance tax or TP reality they have. And value chain analysis can help us in understanding that. So I'll take one example to share with you is that, for example, once we analyze, analyze the various pockets of uh, the value chain and we find that the head office only has board members and they don't have any uh, full-time employees and it is taking a bigger chunk of profits without having FTs on its on its payroll, then yes, it's a concern. Concern where tax authorities will question it why so much profits are being passed uh, in the head office. Then we can have a distorted operating model where we have a lowest distributor who's actually functioning as a full risk distributor by by managing and controlling important decisions and taking risk on its own. So that is also we can spot when we do value chain analysis. And from TP reality perspective, 
what anomaly we can see is that we have the LRD which is compensated on that margin basis but as I mentioned in the operating model where uh, there are people who are taking significant decision controlling risk right so all those decision and risk the loss or profit or on account of that is going to the principal right although in this case the operating model is not right if this is this should have been FRD not this should have been full risk distributor not low risk distributor so the value chain analysis will help us in in defining the right profiling of this entity so head office should be a cost center the LRD should be a full risk distributor should be a profit center and accordingly it should be should be uh, taking some portions of losses which are which are happening because of its, its functions assets and risk now once we have identified this then we have to move to a transpassing model and there the three realities are very important so we have to zoom into the TP model and then we have to talk about whether the sub whether the form matches its substance or form is legal reality what we say in the legal agreement are they also do they also match with the substance people function and then if that is the case then is the entity getting the right profits which are being reflected in the books of that entity so that should also match with the right remuneration model and accordingly right profits or losses needs to be reflected in the financials of that entity next slide yeah um, with regard to the techniques for value chain analysis this is a, we see a four steps of process firstly for the understanding of how value is created in the m and &E, in addition to the functional analysis of the functions assets and risks you need to identify the key value drivers which influence most the success as well as the risk factors of the m and &E in its industry and in its chosen business model secondly from this identification of the value creation you need to map the m and &E's functions as assets and risks with the value creation then define the role responsibilities and control of the individual group entities of the m and &E in this setting lastly step four involves the definition of how the relevant parties now properly identified and assessed in terms of their role in the total set of relationships in the m and &E in the previous three steps how they should be rewarded this step also includes analysis of how prices are set both ex ante and ex post at least three models are relevant for a total value chain analysis the first technique is to compare different ratios within the m and &E group um, an example of conducting a value chain analysis based on this technique is presented in this slide 9 it can be seen from the pie chart that only 6% of the FTEs reside in the Netherlands who contribute 54% of sales and 43% of operating margin while 58% of FTEs reside in China who contribute 9% of sales and 7% of operating margin to the m and this at the very outset will at least lead to a question from the tax authorities on such discrepancy thus the m and &E should include an explanation which can be derived from conducting a value chain analysis of such circumstances in its tracks and transfer pricing documentation and tax returns and local PP forms that need to be filed in this example the Dutch company for example is the owner of the IP the R&D activities take place in Germany China is a contract manufacturer and the UK is acting as a principal and a matchma and matchmaker misalignment is visible when expressed as the ratio of the country versus total group for operating margin sales and FTEs the higher the Delta the greater the need to provide explanations to the tax authorities this is another way of looking at your organization and identify potential mismatches in where the people functions are located and the value is created and where the profit is landing key considerations for such an outlier analysis are the following uh, use simulations and scenarios so conduct what if financial simulations on the key tax and transfer pricing scenarios with respect to the major type of intercompany transactions 
use the outlier analysis to explain major inconsistencies in the C-by-C reporting, and define company as well as industry relevant ratios. If you define which ratios are normal for the group and or the industry, as well as outliers and what could be considered an acceptable standard deviation, you also can see how you are doing. And note that you should choose an applicable statistical methodology here, so an interquartile range. Okay, the next slide is just the explanation we just went through. And we can go to the to technique two, I think. Yeah, thanks, Marcy. So in this technique two, what we are trying to explain is that when we follow the, the value chain analysis approach, and how that helps in allocating the profit margins between different entities in the group. In the first technique, we were looking at there was some anomaly in the sense that we have more uh, FTs in one country and that country had less profits than Y. And this is typically, this typically we can spot in country by country reporting where we have more employees, uh, we have less profits, and then uh, and then in one of the uh, one of the tables in C by C, we have to also mention what activity the entity is, is doing. So another entity uh, which is actually holding the intellectual property, that entity has less employees but more profit. So one can actually compare if the if the local entity which is has many employees is doing contract R and D, one can question that what exactly this function is. But in in a technique two. What we are doing is we are actually uh, looking at and performing the value chain analysis to find that, first of all, the first step for us in this uh, technique too is to understand that how the peer group is performing. So if I need to see how the peer group is performing, I have to look at the financials of my group, how my, how am I trading with the, with the numbers of the peer group? And if there are differences, why those are differences? Are they because of some value drivers that which is leading to a high profit in case of my peer group? And, and in my case, because of I don't have those capabilities, I'm not earning high profits, and I have, I have, less, I have less of those capabilities because there are certain entities in my group, they're performing certain functions, and accordingly, they should be accord rewarded accordingly. So that type of analysis helps in actually defining, allocating all those function, assets, and risk uh, under different categories as I described. And one example I can take is that when you when you when we look at this value chain analysis, one example could be that the, the peer group with whom I'm comparing is that peer group may be having uh, IT platform. Because of that, it is able to uh, uh, receive orders and and process on those orders very fast, and that leads to quick turnaround on time and leads to better cost saving. Do I have that level of that type of capability in me? If yes, then which entity is uh, uh, performing activities around that capability, and that entity should be rewarded uh, uh, as per the function aspect and risk it, it assumes. So in this in this chart, what we have is that we, starting point will be we will determine what is the EBIT margin, the group. A group as a whole is uh, is earning, uh, and then once we have determined the EBIT margin, we have to look at uh, what are the key people function who are performing functions which are leading to that margin, uh, and then once we have done that, we have to assign which are legal entities are performing all these functions. Then accordingly, we have to allocate the, the EBIT margin among those uh, uh, legal entities. So the, the basic approach would be where we can give a routine return to cost centers like contract manufacturing, contract R&D, and if we have an LRD, it gets a net margin uh, based uh, remuneration. And once we have done that, the remaining profits we have can be allocated between IP owner and matchmaking, which is a profit center, and IP owner is an investment center, and that allocation will be based on what value they are creating uh, individually uh, in the value chain. I'll go to the next slide. So one example which I can discuss here is, is uh, uh, a, a pharmaceutical 
M&E group, which is based out of U.S. And as we know that the typical value chain in pharmaceutical industry is that we have research and development, we have uh, ingredient sourcing, we have production, we have sales and marketing. Now, when we look at this, and we have to look at uh, which part of the value chain will lead to a profit center type of profile, which means matchmaking, which means the entity which is uh, which is uh, talking to the supplier, uh, stocking goods, and then the supplier could be uh, the group company which is producing drugs. So stocking is uh, taking inventory positions, taking the present risk, and uh, and then uh, uh, selling uh, drugs to the market. So it's it's more like a matchmaker, and that entity will be uh, called as a profit center. And then we have to look at which entity is responsible for owning the intellectual property in the form of, for example, patents, developing drugs. Which entity is is actually uh, uh, is actually doing drug discovery, which is very crucial uh, in the pharmaceutical value chain, and whether that entity has the people function. And if we are able to identify that then that entity will be more like investment center, which will be, which will be performing uh, the important functions in Tempe, which we call as the development enhancement uh, uh, protection uh, uh, and uh, enhancement of the drugs. So those functions uh, are performed by the investment center and accordingly uh, we will, uh, these two investment center and profit center, they will share the profits uh, based on the contribution they make. So in this example, we have overall EBIT is 15%. So once we give routine returns to uh, to the routine players, and that is we assume 5% uh, for the entities who are uh, performing routine finance, finance activities and entities who are uh, contract manufacturers, contract research and development companies. So once we pay them 5%, we have 10% margin, which is to be split between investment and profit center. And uh, and in our example, we have taken a ratio of 2.5 to 7.5, but this ratio can also be based on what royalty the investment center should receive as a licensor because investment center being the legal and the economic owner of the IP. So if the royalty uh, is paid to the investment center, the remaining uh, the remaining portion of the profits can go to the profit center. We'll go to the next slide. Thank you, Vivender. The steps for applying Technique 3 are the following. You determine the group's consolidated EBIT and allocate EBIT over primary, the, the core business processes. Define interaction between key functions and key processes. And you quantify a relative weight of activity for each interaction. This technique especially helps you to get from the identification of the value creation to the mapping of the M&E's functions, assets, and risks with the value creation. Furthermore, by completing the total number of FTEs in each unit and the total cost for each unit, any outliers will pop, pop up. The difference with the other techniques is that in this case, the contribution margin is all balanced and spread over the group entities. It's a fully integrated business model. This makes it harder to set up a quantitative model based on empirical evidence to isolate the routine functions and allocate EBIT to them in order to quantify the residual and do a further split or allocation of it. I think we should go to the last slide and if you have to turn. Um, uh, what have we learned? Value chain analysis can be seen as the best generation of functional analysis. Value chain analysis helps in allocating profits to different activities and functions. Access to global information means that tax authorities can target M&Es where they perceive a lack of substance or loss of tax revenue, so non-alignment of CYC reporting, transfer pricing documentation, and tax returns. M&Es will need to conduct an analysis of the value chain and people functions annually to prepare the CYC reporting and support the other annual filings. Tax departments need to adjust and clearly identify roles and responsibilities for global tax staff to support the new annual reporting requirements. Um, MEs should align tax returns, local transfer pricing forms, and CYC reporting to ensure all documentation tells a consistent story. 
five signs when you should consider a value chain analysis as part of your BEPS readiness assessment. Uh, firstly, you have not yet finalized your master file approach to presenting your value chain, value drivers, and value creating activities undertaken by the various supply chain participants. Your draft country by country reporting template reflects some deviation between the allocation of your profits and the location of value creating functions. You are still working to articulate what are the value drivers of your business and what business attributes do not generate a competitive advantage nor has the potential to create intangible assets. And lastly, your assessment of the company's value drivers is mainly based on internal data without closely considering industry developments and how competitors are acting. Uh, one overarching question I have is uh, Margin that when we look at uh, uh, value chain analysis, uh, I'm, and I'm again getting back to this action 30, we have master file, local file, and CYC, and we already know the timelines we have for all these three. Uh, certain countries and many countries are following the OCD uh, timeline, like for CYC, we have to have for the companies uh, where the year is starting from 1st Jan 16. Uh, and, and it's, it's, there's still time for companies, but once you have the values freezed, it's not possible to go back and change them. Yeah. Uh, because already many, con fixed, many uh, countries, they yeah. have different uh, year of closing, different tax uh, return uh, month. Uh, so it varies from country to country. So my, my question to you is that, how do you think this sensitivity analysis will help the client? So are you, do you think that a client should now, right now look at how the numbers which are there in country by country reporting, how those numbers the client should look at it, like one example we discussed yeah, about the employees. sooner the better, I would say, that you anticipate any discrepancies and deviations and analyze them and prepare for another trail and for explanations to potential questions from tax authorities. Yeah. That uh, absolutely uh, should be a priority for tax departments uh, today. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I think with this, um, we are at the end of this webinar. And we are checking if there are any questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have a question. I uh, would we'll read it out loud, and then our panelists will answer. Uh, so, OK, there are, there are several questions, actually. So first one, uh, how can you quantify relative contributions in matrix organizations where people collectively decide key commercial strategies and based in multiple countries? Uh, my answer to that is that this is, uh, again, as I explained the value chain analysis, the relative contribution has to be uh, uh, defined on the basis of uh, interviewing the people, like interviewing the people who are performing uh, those people function, and based on the discussion with them, we need to identify that what's relative weight uh, their function carry, uh, but I, I do note that this is not purely a full 100% objective exercise where I say 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, but at the same time, uh, that's how we need to do, but the saving grace here is that we are looking at the industry as a whole, where we are looking at what how peer groups are, what they are doing, what what profitability they are earning, but yes, there is also limitation, we don't get all that information in public public database because you cannot get the details to that level. But yes, this is largely based on the robust uh, function analysis yes. we do with those engagements. Still, the functional analysis as done always for transfer function purposes is the basis. Okay, uh, second question. For China value chain analysis, how do you expect the study to look like? I guess we were trying to locate uh, already internally a Chinese uh, yeah, they have to provide a template, yet it's not provided. So do we have any expectation? Um, the Chinese. Yeah, yeah, well, they have issued all those forms, yeah. which, which are already. Which are there on yeah, their website. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and need to be already now, as we speak, to be completed and filed. And how does it look like? The, 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 the different forms for the, diff, the, the different that's, topics that's, that's for the 2022. Uh, uh, it's more yeah. like tables. And yeah, yeah. yeah. And okay. descriptions, yes. tables and, and financials, yes. Okay. 
Uh, we, we can provide more information uh, after this webinar if so desired. And you can contact us. We do have those uh, tables with us and we can share with you separately. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. One more question. When the foreman, uh, okay. Oh, we have lots of questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, when performing uh, value chain analysis as well as preparing CBT master files, should m and be focused on local stat numbers or U.S. gap numbers? I think for the focus is that we need to focus on one accounting standard across the group. Yeah, so if you want to follow U.S. gap, follow across so that we should not have inconsistency and we can interpret in that manner. So we suggest to use one consistent uh, accounting standard yeah, which, you is follow. Used, which is used more, uh, with uh, most of your entities in the group. Yeah, and you follow the standard used by the group. Okay. Uh, how do you explain the combination of the value chain with the business results in the country cases uh, where you have shared services uh, established in a country with no operations beside internal services? And let me read this question, yeah. uh, question again to for me to understand it better. How do you explain the combination of its value chain with the business results of the country in cases where you have shared services established in, in a country with no operations besides internal services. Now again, here we are talking about people function and if we have a shared service center in one country and with no operations, uh, no operations in the sense that if they don't have operations which are serving to end customer, if it is if they are only serving to the group entity, then it's more like a cost center. If a lot of uh, uh, key uh, decision related to risk are taken by the, the service recipient, which is possibly apparent. In that case, it's a cost center. But if the shared service center is only uh, is there in the local territory, and uh, the functions are only for the local business, because we I have seen models where there are four group entities in one country, and they provide services to each other. So that's more or more of local transferring issue. But if there's a TP regulation in that country, one has to uh, uh, still uh, apply the local rules to satisfy the arms yeah. principle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one more question. How will the tax authorities react to revision of the taxpayer's pricing policy after applying the value chain analysis, which might jeopardize the position taken by taxpayers in previous years? So it's more like a roll, roll it back. I think, uh, again, uh, uh, you, uh, you know, if the audit years are open and if the tax credits can, as per rule, they can go back, yes, they will go back. But I think my view is that it's better to be transparent and discuss upfront with the tax authorities and, uh, and share the results because if we don't do it, uh, the issues keep piling up and then we run a larger risk at a later date. Yeah. And prepare and, and all the trail. Okay, one last question. Uh, will the tax authorities of the high profit reporting company in the group be fine to let go or to reduce the profitability in their own jurisdiction once the group considers to revise their existing transfer pricing policy? Will the tax authorities of the high profit reporting company in the group? be fine to let go or reduce the profitability in their own jurisdiction once a group considers to revise their existing pricing policy. I think this is okay yeah. if this yeah. matches its substance, right. if this matches with the outcome of value chain analysis, and if it's in line with the, the three realities we discussed, yeah. legal reality, financial reality, and economic reality. If uh, this situation satisfies that, the this is a consequence change, that the tax authorities their, can say. Change their yeah. uh, transmission policy. Yeah. Okay, if it is appropriately applied and accurately delineated. Yeah, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you everybody for your questions. That was very useful. And we hope to see you on our next webinars. And please leave, uh, after you're closing the webinar, you will receive a review form. Please provide your comments if you feel appropriate. Uh, and the record will be available on our website uh, shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.